Okay, so thanks everyone for being here. All right, you're fast. Right, fast about that. Okay, everybody didn't get food. Please help yourself. Um, if you didn't sign in, we have a sign-in sheet. Make sure that you're signing in so we know you're here. Um, if you didn't get a t-shirt, grab your t-shirt before you leave tonight. Um, those are really cool and they're totally free, so take one. Um, our third workshop, there's a, two small typographical errors on here. It's not going to be in 2017, it's actually going to be in 2018, believe it or not. Um, and we're not going to be at Denault Auditorium anymore because it's just too big of a space. Um, and a classroom like this is going to be more appropriate, but Library Arts 123 was locked down for that day, so I'm still working with Davis Garden to find a suitable location for us. So keep an eye out um, for the emails. I'll let you guys know where we're going to be. Um, but that's going to be at um, 5.30 p.m., just like tonight. Um, also, including the email that I sent out this afternoon, it's probably not as relevant for those of you who are here right now because you're here, but we did send out a brief survey based on your availability on Wednesday nights, Thursday nights, to figure out kind of when the best option for everybody as a group is able to get together. Um, obviously, people have work conflicts and school conflicts and all sorts of stuff. Um, so fill that out for me, even though you guys are out here. So I'm assuming this time works for you, but if not, just let me know. Um, 90 second pitch. Um, that's kind of, you know, sometimes that gets, that falls through the cracks a little bit because everybody focuses on their main um, presentation deck and plan. Uh, but don't forget to be preparing for that. It's 90 seconds. And that is an optional competition. I suppose if you don't want to do it, you don't have to. But it's an easy way to make some free money. So you might as well do it. And that's only one person from your team gets to talk during that. Um, Homework for the next workshop. The next workshop is the presentation workshop. So have a rough draft of your business plan and presentation ready to go, ready to talk about. Um, the, the presentation speaker will um, want to give you guys some, some um, suggestions and probably listen to what you have to say based on what you'll be talking about. So make sure you have some of that ready to go because we are only like five weeks away from the competition now, so it's going to start coming quick, and it's a lot of work. So, um, Then on March 31st, which is just three days after that workshop, is going to be the due date for your written portion. That's due one week before the competition, so March 31st is the day. It's a Saturday. Um, remember that your, your written portion doesn't have to be a full business plan this year. We're just requiring the executive summary, the marketing research and plan, and then the summary financials. Um, all of that is detailed for you a little bit more in depth um, in the rules on the shared drive that you all have access to. So make sure you're going through that and reading that as well. Um, competition schedule, it's a Saturday, so hopefully you guys don't have too many time conflicts. Um, but we are going to have a, a um, sign up at the next workshop when you can say, you know, I want to go first or I want to go last, and you'll be able to give your preferences. Um, so make sure that you guys are here to sign up for that. Otherwise, I'm going to assign you, and more than likely, you're probably not going to like where you end up. And then lastly, mentors. Uh, I've talked to you, some of you tonight, about mentors. For those who I haven't talked to, um, come talk to me afterwards. We're still working on um, finding you guys the best mentor for your team. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce Jeff Greenberg. He's going to be our speaker tonight. Uh, I'm not going to botch his resume for you, so I'll let him introduce himself a little bit more in depth and uh, tell you why he's so qualified to be here as a speaker tonight. So let's give Jeff, Jeff a nice one. Why I'm qualified to be here tonight? Because nobody else offers. <laughs> um, so uh, I am a serial high-tech entrepreneur. Uh, I built a couple of companies. Uh, the last one, a company called Hyperwall, that's a video wall system that are used in command and control centers. Uh, think about a movie like uh, The Taking of Color 123. Remember the room Denzel Washington worked in with that giant video wall that showed all the subways? My company actually makes those systems that are actually used in Los Angeles by LA Metro to track the movements of all the buses and trains throughout LA. We're also used in the Moscow subway system and we're used in Jakarta for a smart city project 
and in about 60 countries around the world, we have customers using our system. Hey, it's time for the Concordia Business Finance Over. <laughs> Look at that. All right. I started that company with <clears throat> two partners and $150 and grew it into a global multi-billion dollar business. I ran this CEO for eight and a half years. Two years ago, uh, somebody had brought in as an assistant took over day-to-day -day operations so I could move on and do my next thing. So I am a, a real serial entrepreneur, mostly in high tech, yeah, exclusively in high tech. Uh, I am also a professor of entrepreneurship at Saddleback College, where I teach a class called Financing the Entrepreneurial Business, teaching my students how to go get the money they need to get their businesses going. And I am a coach for many startups, helping them get going. <clears throat> That's my credential in education. I have a bachelor's in computer science from Rutgers. Who can tell me something about Rutgers? It's in New Jersey. I don't like the river. You don't? The river's awesome! Maybe now. <laughs> Not when I was there. Were you there? My best friend went to Rutgers for his PhD, and we go to J. So I'm sure it's a lot better. Now. Oh, it, how long ago? Yeah, it, it, um, New Brunswick has gone through huge um, urban revitalization. It's beautiful. I, I would imagine it was a while ago. Yeah, I remember the river now. So, so Rutgers is the State University of New Jersey, just like the UC system here, and just like the UC system, it has multiple campuses throughout the state. So, BS in computer science from there, uh, MS in computer science from UC Irvine, just over the hill, and an MBA from Pepper. So today we're going to talk about building a financial model for your business. In fact, one of the homework assignments, the last thing you read off the list was to do a financial summary. And the financial summary has to come from something and it shouldn't just be making up some numbers. So we're going to talk about how to uh, build a projection for what your company is going to do. And we're going to start by talking about we're going to make up a fictitious company. Most people, when they want to do a financial projection, just jump right into a spreadsheet. Is that what everybody's going to do? That's the wrong thing to do. What you really have to do is understand qualitatively what your business is. So we're going to go through that exercise first. Let me also ask, what are people's hard stop times? Because we're starting at 6. We go to eight. Is that a problem? My hard stop time is eight. Eight. Yeah. I get Anybody two have hours. a hard stop earlier than eight? Our class is six thirty. Six thirty. Yeah. All right. For those of you who don't have class, does anybody else have a hard stop time? All right. So we'll be here till eleven or twelve. No. <laughs> we'll, we'll, I'll keep it to two hours. Um, so, does anybody actually have a business? <laughs> a business, actually, have a business. Okay, then does anybody have a business idea that they want us to model today? Yes. Yes. I'm not going to ask, come, this is not third grade, you don't have to raise your hand, just, just yell at me, it's okay. What? What's your business idea? Who wants to have their business model? Go. 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 So, we're basically a peer to peer lending. Um, Application. Okay. Um, so I feel like Ryan can explain this a little better. Yeah. Uh, what do you want? What do I do? Kind of I, I want to know what it is. So, so it's peer to peer lending. Uh, we want to like, be in the financial services industry. Heard of like companies like Upstart that do peer to peer lending. We're just trying to make it more decentralized, where like anyone can do it. You don't have to be an accredited investor. Um, and you guys are taking a, a cut off the top, huh? Yeah. Yeah. We work with like we'll charge like an origination. Um, okay. We want to have like applications for like, small businesses, different projects, localized community projects. So All right. So we're going to do a financial model for that business. You can't turn this in. This is not your homework. <laughs> this is a class thing. You guys are going to have to change it somehow. <laughs> All right. Who who's a business who's a business major? Okay. Who who didn't raise their hand? You didn't raise your hand. Yeah, I'm working on a graduate program. You're just lazy, huh? Organizational leadership and you're lazy? That doesn't work. Huh? Okay. So, for this business of peer-to-peer -peer lending, 
how are you going to determine what your revenue is going to be? What are the factors that are going to determine your revenue? How much you charge? Yes, right? So, so basic, the basics of revenue are, are volume times price. Pretty simple, right? What's going to determine your volume? Well, yeah, that is the volume. What's going to determine it? How are you going to get volume? Where's the volume coming from? Hmm? Industry practices. What are the factors that are going to determine it? What I want to try and do, there's, there's going to be two assumptions that we're going to have to have in our spreadsheet. What is the volume and what is the price? At least the average price. So now let's break these down into sub-assumptions. Where's the volume going to come from? How are you going to get customers? And, and I'm talking to them because it's their project. Who's, who's on this team? Four right there? Okay. But I'm talking to everybody else. What's going to determine their volume of customers? Our marketing. Excuse me? Our marketing. Marketing. That's right. How much you spend on marketing? <laughs> <laughs> what else is going to determine your volume? Oh, what are your idea is the good idea can make the volume of the customer like expanding exponentially. Okay, good idea is a little vague. Can you be more specific? Like how attracting your stuff is. Is your product is a blue sea or not? Like, I'm sorry, con contracting? No, is your product a blue sea or not? Like a new market? Using the quality of the product. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Uh, so quality is really something that will cost you volume, it won't increase your volume, but it can it can reduce volume. So so yes, that, that is a determinant. Yes? Manufacturing or distribution? Well, in some cases, how good your manufacturing is maybe, but there's no manufacturing here. So one other thing, which I think actually for this case might be really good, is repeat customers. Somebody who borrows this month may need to borrow another month, so how, how much um, recycling you can do, right? It was uh, back there. So again? Uh, yes, I think you also need to consider your competitors to see if there's any infringements. Um, yeah, um, that will affect things, but that's not necessarily something that's in your control. So, so what, what I want to do is, is sort of come up with something that says, you know, um, how much we spend on marketing uh, is going to then be, um, uh, if we're going to spend $1,000 a month on marketing and we know our customer acquisition cost is $100, then that means we're going to acquire 10. So that's something that's really quantifiable. Co competition is sort of like quality. That's a little bit harder to quantify and I don't want to try and do that for this exercise. That doesn't mean it should be ignored. but. Trying to quantify it for this exercise would be too hard. Yes? Yeah, they're kind of controlled because they can control the volume by um, understanding or making it easy for a person to qualify. Either lend money or receive it. Um, like there's 100 people, the and only 2% of them have a 700 score credit score, but everybody else has a lower score. Okay, so yes, so but then you assuming more risk, but yeah. you probably compensate for that by charging a higher price. Perhaps actually, you're not assuming the risk because you're not doing the lending. So somebody else is assuming the risk, so you're risk free. But we'll see how this this assumption breaks down into sub assumptions, and then we can break these into other sub assumptions. I don't want to go too far with that. Let's talk about price. What's going to determine the price per customer, the, the, the revenue per customer? Well, it's like kind of like that, right? Our, do we have like, well, well, it's an origination fee. Okay. So it's going to probably be like a set fee for depending maybe on depending on how much they have to So is it borrow? a set fee or is it a percentage of loan? It'll be a percent of the amount. Okay. So, the, so it's, it's depending on the amount borrowed. I'm going to change this from price to be more specific. 
it's really revenue per customer, right? And so that's going to be a, can't do a percent sign, percent of transaction, right? And what's the transaction range going to be? The, the transaction amount. Are we doing $50 loans, $5,000 loans, $50 million loans? Okay. Are there going to be different rates for small loans versus big loans? So how many categories of loans will there be? We're talking about the length of loan, how long they have to be paid. Okay. So so what is the percentage going to vary? What, what, what range? It's probably going to be pretty low. Yeah. Um, maybe like 1 to 5%. 1 to 5. Okay. Two sides of the business. The other side is there can also be part of our business is allowing just like individuals to lend money to each other mm -hmm. um, and actually charge interest and like enter into smart contracts with each other. Um, and so, like, we're allowing people access as personal borrowers mm -hmm. for like a, a certain fee like, per month or something like that, too. So, that's another kind of side. There's two sides. It's okay. Like businesses that want to fund projects and stuff like that. All right, so for tonight, we're going to keep it easy. We're just going to focus on this. All right, so that's revenue. What's the other side of a business from a financial point of view? Expenses. expenses. What are going to be our expenses? Like maybe customer acquisition costs. Right. So it's marketing. What's another expense? Okay. Well, so we wouldn't, we're, we're taking the big out entirely. Okay. So we don't even, yeah. Big, what's the biggest expense in any company? Thank you, yes. HR, organizational, come on. <laughs> yes, HR expenses. It seems pretty small from my perspective. It's something, but it just seems small if you guys are building it out. Oh, we still have, like, there are... There's like a whole application process for like okay. Approved, so it's like we have like account managers. So you've got software development costs, development right? Costs. And, and you have um, uh, regulatory yeah. approval, right? Because you're 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 a FinTech, <laughs> right? You guys get to use a fancy acronym, all right? Regulatory approval. How about lease? Where are you going to run this business out of? Probably office. Yeah. yeah. Probably like office. Yeah. Like, okay, so you're going to need a lease for your office space. Some utilities. Utilities, okay. Where is this app going to run? Up in the cloud someplace? Yeah, we'll probably be on the website. Okay. So you're going to have hosting fees, right? <coughs> Any other expenses? There's lots of them. Like maintenance fees. Maintenance fees. Maybe not really. That's probably no, in, uh, below the uh, noise level. We want to uh, we want to make sure our customers feel safe, so we want to be able to be paid. <coughs> Really? Wow, you're assuming some risk, huh? What did you just say? Repeat it. Oh, oh, in case in case a loan defaults, we want to be able to either be paid with our origination fees or some kind of fees. So, like insurance, is that what you're saying? So, so they, they're, you're saying you want to be the insurer? No, you want to be the underwriter for the loan? The way that we have it set up is where, like, we're not. Like one project won't be solely funded by one person, it'll be funded by the school of the mm -hmm. And they'll all be still all have like a small state in their investment yeah. and those will be spread out amongst. Okay. So it's what we do we have like certain pools like depending on what kind of project that we're invested. Mm -hmm. um, so like, for example that pool would have its own like insurance kind of built into it based on 
Well, that's that's not really insurance. That's just um, a portfolio theory, right? Uh, giving each person a diversified portfolio, so even if one fails, everything else covers. That's different than insuring. We're not. Yeah, we're not really going to. Okay. All right. Like we're we're allowing people to do the same We're just okay. Any other expenses that should go in here? <coughs> this is modeling. Is thinking about what are the assumptions that are going to affect your revenue? What are the assumptions that are going to affect your expenses? And then make some guesses about what they are. What is your volume going to be? What is your revenue per customer going to be? Make some guesses, and then you go out and you test it. You do some customer discovery calls. That's something you guys have talked about, right? To see, is there really a way you can get that many customers? How effective might your marketing be? How, how much quality will affect this? How much uh, repeat business might you get? You'll make assumptions about that, plug it into a spreadsheet, and see what comes out. And you'll make assumptions about this. And if these are the assumptions, then really you can think of them as variables. What happens if we change this variable and this variable? How does it affect the financial outcome of the business? Do a nice spreadsheet with this. You can actually realize what will work and what won't. Yes, uh, two days ago I did a similar presentation like this over at UCI. And they were they wanted to do a, a business of selling uh, custom T-shirts at at uh, the swap, and it turned out the business had a fatal flaw. It was going to grow to a certain size, and it would never be able to get bigger. And the reason was it actually had no repeat business. And if you don't have repeat business, it's very difficult to grow the business because you're every week you're spending the same amount of money to get the same amount of new customers. If you can't get a repeat factor in there, the, 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 the return on investment for marketing is always going to be fine. Hi, email mail. Anybody use Cox for their email? Huh. Very unreliable. <clears throat> Alright, so this is not an exhaustive set of assumptions, but it's enough to get started. So now, and let me ask, who's done spreadsheets? Anybody not done spreadsheets? Okay, so we're going to go really fast for you, which is why I asked them to videotape it. So after this is over, you can go watch the video three or four times and then pretend like you understand it. So here is a spreadsheet. And what I'm going to do is put across the top some dates. So we're just going to do a, do a business for this year, January of 2018. And I know January's past already, let's not worry about that. February of 2018. And then I'm just going to drag that along for the entire year. And our revenue, we're going to have some assumptions. The assumptions are what's going to be our marketing budget. Really what we want is what's going to be our cost of customer acquisition. That's, that's what marketing is going to drive. So somebody give me a number. A thousand. A thousand? A thousand dollars to acquire a customer. Oh, for one? We'll say, we'll, let's just say $200. $200. Okay, now keep in mind that the cost of customer acquisition is higher than the revenue per customer. It's a failing business right out of the gate. How much revenue do you guys expect to get per customer? Five, you said one to five percent. What do you expect the uh, range of loans to be? Probably average, six billion. said between 100 and 10,000. Okay, between one hundred and ten thousand. So, at a ten thousand dollar loan, five percent of that is five hundred dollars. So, at the very high end, the revenue per customer is going to be five hundred. And if we have a customer acquisition cost of two hundred, we're already in trouble. So, let's say customer acquisition is fifty. Okay. And by the way, that's the reason we do this, to test some assumptions, 
see what works, see what doesn't, see what we need to verify with the market, or see that some numbers don't even need to be verified from the market, they're just, they're not plausible. And what I like to do is, uh, this is an assumption, I'm going to put it in a cell that's co colored, and I'm going to right click on it, and down here where it says insert comment, I'm going to put a comment that says average customer acquisition cost. And by doing that, now I can put my mouse there, and I know what that, that number represents. We also said that revenue is going to be determined by repeat customers. What percent of our customers are going to repeat? Yeah, we're, we're, yeah, I think. 90%? Yeah, that's a little high. I think you're a little optimistic there. 75%. Uh, let's have somebody not on the team give us a number. 60%. 20%, okay. 20%, and we're going to, oops. We're going to color that blue, and I'm going to give that a note that says, um, customer repeat rate over what term is that? that? That's a good question. What yearly, five years? <clears throat> that makes a difference. It does. We're, we're going to make the modeling easy, so I'm just going to say each month it's that percentage of the previous month, and if 20% is the annual rate, then we can just divide that by 12 to get the monthly rate, at least as a first order approximation. All right, and so we've got average customer acquisition cost, we've got a repeat rate, and let's, you know what, let's do it different. I'm going to put the volume on here. So let's do that. And then down here, I'm going to put a marketing expense line. And for now, I'm just going to put in some dummy numbers. Say we're going to spend $1,000 a month. So in this month, our volume will be $1,000 divided by 50, which is giving us 20 from the marketing. And then it's going to be that plus 20% of what we had the previous month divided by 12. Everybody get that? So it equals the previous month, which is going to be um, used after there, times 20% slash 12. Now since there was no, no previous, it's not going to change, but if I copy this formula into the next cell, it's not going to work now. Got a bizarre number. And this is where we get to some fancy spreadsheet. If I look here and copy this formula into the next cell, you'll notice that here we had E16 divided by B2, and here Excel automatically changed it to F16 divided by C2. What happens is this is what's called relative addressing. <clears throat> F16 means this number. But what Excel interprets that to mean is look at the cell that is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. Look at the cell that's 14 cells below me. And if I copy this formula to here and look at the cell that's 14 below me, it'll be here. So that's relative addressing. 14 below me. What we want, in some of the cases, relative, but when we're referring back to these constants, we don't want our references to move to the right. So what we're going to do is, where we refer to the B and C numbers, we put a dollar sign in 
front of it. And the dollar sign means, I don't mean backwards three columns, it means I mean C. And it doesn't matter if I'm referencing it from here or from a thousand rows out. Dollar sign C means always C, whereas just C means relative to which cell I'm in. A little complex, but very important. Yes? So, the volume deals or custom? Where it deals or not the custom? It's, it's, to, uh, to me, it's the number of loans number of brokered deals. in the month. Number of deals. So, it's going to go from 20 deals to 5,000? No, it's not. Oh. Because, because, because I didn't put a dollar sign in, this is referencing the wrong cell. Oh. I'm going to fix that now by putting a dollar sign in. Here. And in front of the B. Now if I copy this over, you'll notice that Jack's still referencing B and that's still referencing C, but where this referenced E, this referenced F. So <clears throat> putting the dollar sign in locks it to that specific cell. So basically, because of our 20% repeat rate, we picked up a third of a client. And then what I can do is simply take this formula and copy it all the way across, and we're going to see some slow growth. Now that's volume. Yes? I don't understand. It's 20% of what? 20 deals. It's talking about 20 transactions. It's, it could yeah. be one client, right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's it not the number of clients, it's the number of transactions. It's the number of transactions, right. right. So it could be one client or it could be 20 clients. The numbers that you had up there were customer acquisition costs and customer. So this 20, there are two ways to get a customer. <laughs> Number one is spend money on marketing, which is the first half of the formula. E16, if I spend $1,000 on marketing and, and it's $50 per customer, I'm going to get 20 customers. But then I also have the second half of the formula, which is 20% of the customers I had in the previous month are going to reach me. Yeah, 20% divided by 12. And that's where the growth is coming from, because since we have flat marketing investment, we're always going to be getting 20 customers from our marketing, and then we're going to slowly grow this from the repeat business. Okay. So that doesn't need a fence around it. No, it, it a lot of people will do that for clarification, but the rules of precedence say do the multiplication and the division first, do this one first, and the addition is the last thing. So it actually does work out properly. But if you're not sure, putting parentheses in does help clarify it. Okay, so the amount of growth we're getting here is not a lot. It's probably going to be better than that. It does. So one of the things that we can do is say here. Yes. So if we're keeping 20% of our customers each month, then we should be going by at least four customers each month, right? We start with 20. 20%. It's 20 percent divided by 12 because it's. 20% 20, 20 is the annual repeat rate, but we're doing it monthly. Okay, so okay. It's, it's, it's one twelfth of 20% because you, you, you pointed out that this would be an annual, not monthly. So, okay, okay, so okay. one twelfth of 20% is uh, 1.6 or something like that percent. So it's not a lot of growth. That's a low repeat rate. Right. Okay. That's, that's on the build, though. That doesn't include new clients that you want to have. That's the repeat. Yes, yes. So so this is how we get new clients, and the 20% is how we get more. more. But that might be a little higher because it's based on the term of the loan. Usually people aren't going to get a big loan until they're matured that loan. So it might be a little high on the repeat. Well, yes, so what we could do is say it's only 20% of the people that have had their loans more than in six months or a year. Probably a year. Which which we can put into the model, but that's out of the scope for, for this. Yeah, okay. There are ways of doing that, though. 
Now this is how we forecast the volume. Now we got to get to revenue. All right, so what are the assumptions we're going to put in about revenue per transaction? have multiple products. So we could have the, the um, below loan, which is 5% fee, and the high loan where there's only a 2.5% fee because they're, they're loaning more. I don't want to do that now because that'll complicate things. But, so let's just say it's going to be 2.5% And what's going to be the average loan amount? A thousand, okay. So our revenue is going to be the number of loans we make times an average of a thousand times how much of a commission we make. And the B and the C, again, need dollar signs. So we're going to make 500 bucks the first month. Not a lot of money. And Stop growing pretty fast. So everybody with me so far? If you're not with me so far, you got to say something because you're going to get further and further behind as we go on. Anybody ever flown in the exit row of an airplane? <laughs> and and the flight attendant requires a verbal confirmation that you understand the rules of sitting in the exit row. So I'm going to require verbal confirmation that everybody is with me. Do you understand? Yes. Oh boy, that was, was that a statement or a question? That was a statement? Yes, I understand, or maybe I understand. You're good. Yes. You're comfortable. Verbal response. Oh, yes. The airplane can't take off if you don't respond. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Do you guys count? We don't count, yeah. but yes, I'm okay. okay. <laughs> We're including you. Thank you. All right. So everybody understands there can be no excuses from here on out. We have a verbal contract. All right. So we've got a problem here that our revenue. It's about $500 a month, and we're spending about $1,000 a month on marketing. Doesn't look like a very good business, does it? Maybe we should do capital equipment leases. We haven't even gotten to the other expenses, that's right. So, so well, no, I mean as a, as a business. Well, or we can say that um, uh, $50, I should put a dollar sign here. A $50 customer acquisition cost is too high. So let's just change that to five. Oh, now all of a sudden we're making Ooh, money. Look that at that. So nice, okay. See how this works though? Those blue numbers are variables. We change a variable, it ripples through the entire thing, and now we get a little bit more information about it. Now, is $5 a reasonable customer acquisition cost? Probably not. Okay, let's go to 10, see what happens. All right, it's about what we expect. But at least it allows us to understand how this modeling works. Now, one thing I'll tell you is that marketing generally should not be a fixed amount, but it probably should be a percent of revenue. So instead of just saying a thousand, let's put a variable in. What percent of our revenue do we want to spend on marketing? Twenty percent? Okay. Twenty percent. And that's I'm gonna put a comment in there. It's 
notice or comment. Percent of revenue spent on marketing. So now what we're going to do is say this equals that times revenue, and I have to do it for the month before. And here's why. If we do the marketing expense as a percentage of the month before, first of all, that's realistic. You get a bunch of money in, you see how much you got, and spend a piece of that for the next month. But also, there's a, there's a problem with a spreadsheet. How much we spend here will affect what our revenue is, and our revenue will affect how much we can spend, and that's what's called a circular reference. This is dependent on that, that's dependent on this. Excel can't do that, in fact, nobody can. So you never have, can have two cells dependent on each other. So we make this dependent on the previous month, and this will be pre and that, and that. Okay, so I'm going to put in my dollar sign in front of the B, which means we're going to have zero that month. Well, that's another possibility. So, so in that month, we're just going to decide we're going to spend a thousand dollars. Okay. And now, B sixteen times E three. So we're in a death spiral here because why? Yeah, it's not, it's not enough. The 20% the is simply not enough investment in marketing to get us there. So let's go back. If we go to $5 customer acquisition costs. All right. So at $5 customer acquisition costs, it is slowly growing. So now we're starting to learn some really interesting things about this business model. Um, but now we are starting to see a slow increase in the amount we can spend on marketing, which is resulting on a slow increase on our revenue month over month. You also have other options, though, right? I mean, you could say your average revenue is out of a three thousand dollar loan. We can say lots of things. <laughs> but to my oh, point, you yeah. learn things. Like you might find out that okay, the tiny hundred dollar loans aren't going to work for you. You've yeah. got to go after a minimum of two thousand. Right? Exactly. So, yeah. so this is. This is how we test it to see, are these assumptions valid? So initially, we had an assumption that revenue has to exceed expenses, and it didn't. So we had to make changes. Then we have to look at other things like this, and ultimately, this will tell us if this business even has a chance of being profitable. And I have had people who did a spreadsheet and realized there was no way they were ever going to actually make money. And that's a really important thing to know when you're planning on launching a business. Well, I, I think the other thing is you're probably going to have two to three months of expenses if you're getting revenue. Yes. So you're going to have to do marketing. So you got a couple months there with no revenues and negative cash flow. Because you're not going to get sales from month one. So you have to go backwards a little bit. Yes. So, 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 so um, what, what I sometimes put in here are ramp time. So in a business, for instance, when you're hiring salespeople to do sales, if you hire somebody to do selling, they are not an effective salesperson on day one. Depending on the industry, it can take up to six months for them to become effective. So really, your revenue is based on how many salespeople you had six months ago, because those are the people that are fully trained. So you have to always... It's the bill. It's the bill. But yeah. again, a percentage in the first two years is probably not a good idea. It's not going to have any revenue. You have to spend. You're talking well, about here. In the marketing, it's yes. spend a lot more than 20% of the first year. That could months. be. So, so we'll get to that further down when we look at what kind of investment is needed to be able to. I, I'm talking about the capital raise is necessary to support these initial launch expenses. So, so we'll get to that. All right, so we have a revenue line. Marketing is one expense. What, what was the other biggest expense? Labor. Labor. So let's put in some labor. So, so what's the um, staff of this company going to be? Tell me a, 
a, a title and how many people like that we're going to have. Account managers? Okay. How many account managers are we going to have and how much do they cost? And here's a, cl a clue. Let's make it small because otherwise this business is never going to be profitable. You're going to have five account managers. Wow, you guys are losing money. <laughs> are they salespeople? Yeah. So, all right, and, and we're going to pay them each $100 a month. Because that's all we're going to be able to afford. Okay. All right. Well, because you guys are going to be the salespeople for the first few months. Yeah, honestly. So, you, you yeah. paying yourself $100 probably, is fine. We're really <laughs> not even going to have these people for, for yeah. that down line too. Let's lead up to three, and, and I'm going to show you why. CXO, we're going to have a CEO, a CTO. Which who's the CEO? Who's the CTO? Which C are you? CMO. CMO. CFO. CFO. Okay, so we got four CXOs. And how many of the CX? How much is the CXOs making? Five hundred. <laughs> Whoa. We're probably not going to make it anyway. Yeah, we're bending it all back into the business, but Ryan's phone was reading today, so. That's okay. The whole point of doing the spreadsheet is to see what's possible and what's not. And then what else are you going to need um, on your staff? We're going to need software development. Are you going to do it in-house or you're going to outsource it? Outsource it. If you're outsourcing it, you don't need it in-house. It, it does count as an expense, but it's, it'll, it's not an HR expense. Um, How about a bookkeeper? Oh, I'll be. Oh, the CFO is the bookkeeper? I mean, initially, I'm probably going to do it at all. All right. And, yeah. and you know, that's actually what the E in CEO means, right? Everything. Everything, yes. Everything. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. I mean, like, I meant anything related to finance. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, so, I'm going to put. put uh, I want to come up with one more title I'm going to have. We're saying legal. Oh, but that's a word to outsource. Le legal will be outsourced. Yeah. Um, somebody said tech support, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, or customer service. Or call it customer service. That's that's more positive. Tech support implies problems. Customer service implies just taking care of people. So I'm going to say one, and they're going to be paid $125 a month. How's that? Okay. Now, what we're going to say is, in January, actually, it's not the way I used to do it. All right. Yeah. All right. I, I'm going to do it a different way. I'm going to say that we're going to have four CXOs every month. And I'm going to get rid of these variables. And account managers, we're going to have, what was it? Three? Yeah. yeah. And customer service, we're going to have one. Now, here's where we get to have some fun. I'm going to put in a really cool formula here. So our total HR expenses is going to be 500 times 4 plus 100 times 3 plus 125 times 1. Everybody get that? Yeah. And there's a formula called sum product, a function called sum product, which does exactly that. I'm going to point it at this array of 3, this array of 3, and it's going to do all that for us. Okay, so sum product. of array one, which is these three, comma, array two, which is these three, but C's, the C's have to have their dollar sign, so it's always pointing to the blue ones. Put in my closing parenthesis. It's costing us 24 25 to hire all those people. 
and I'm going to copy this all the way across, and it's going to be the same every month. But as you start to have more and more customers, you're going to need more customer service people. So maybe here we're going to change to two. And notice everything gets updated. Hopefully the Sometimes difference is. Sometimes it'll be higher. Excuse me? Sometimes some months you've got three papers, so you got to adjust it. Well, but this is how many customer service people we're going to have. It's still adjusted based on the pay. Someone said three. Pay well, we're going for a oh, an oh. estimate at this point. Well, oh, estimate. Oh, there's three pay periods, but but actually, um, in terms of how you accrue it, you you still accrue it by the month, well, even, if, even yeah. if it's paid separately. So that's the difference between uh, income statement and cash flow. Well, so again, you have cash flow issues. Right. Well. Yes. for those three months, three right. papers, right? But let's assume this is a company that pays twice a month on the 15th and 30th. Then we don't, we don't have to worry about that. Okay. Okay, so here is a nice way to calculate all of our base HR. So, so this is an, an HR subtotal. Now what else is going to go into HR costs? Benefits, okay. And what percent what percent are we gonna pay for benefits? <laughs> so yeah, a, 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 a company yeah. with absolutely no benefits has to would, has to pay about fifteen percent more than salaries because they have to make contributions for um, social security and unemployment and disability. So so this is what's called the burden rate. So as an employer, if you pay somebody $100, that person at a minimum costs you $115. And if you're going to have benefits like health insurance or a 401k or vision insurance or disability, it can go higher. So maybe 25, 30% for a company with really good benefits. So are you guys generous for your employees or really stingy? Young, we're stingy. You're stingy, okay. So your benefits rate is going to be 15%. I'm going to put a blank line in here before we get to that. What's another HR related expense we're going to have? Hey, oh, actually, service. two. Uh, yeah, but that's actually not HR. That, that would go into professional services. Oh. So there's really two other kinds of HR service, of, of HR expenses there's commissions for the salespeople. And there might be bonuses for the entire company, right? So I'm going to put in here two blank lines, and that's the HR subtotal. I'm then going to say, what is our bonus? How, what percent of revenue are we going to give out as bonuses to our employees? One percent of revenue? Yes. One percent. One percent. I don't know. <laughs> okay. You, you, you're, you're being an excellent entrepreneur because you're stingy, which is necessary at this point. So one percent of revenue. That equals 5,000 times the 1%. Yeah, just type something with a dollar sign. And so it's 50 bucks. Ooh, oh, wow. Bonus. Maybe, maybe a little lower? <laughs> That's OK. Oh, it's a variable. We can change it, right? And it's going to go all the way up to $60 a month by the end of the year. And then commission. Oops. What's our commission rate going to be? Commissions can be off revenue, or commissions can be off gross margin. Um, How would you do commission if we're getting, right now you have us getting revenue from fees, so... So, oh, the, com the commission, commission if, if we said the commission is 2%, uh -huh. it would be 2% of this number, is what we're paying as commissions. Okay. So we'll put 2% in there for commissions, because that's what somebody, I think, said. And now we're going to say this equals that times the commission rate. Let's not forget our dollar sign. Which is 100. And our benefits is 15%. 
So that equals 15% times the sum of this plus this plus this. And so our HR total is the HR subtotal plus bonuses plus commissions plus benefits. 2961, and now I'm going to take these two and copy them all across.
Why did it not go red? I want it to go red. There we go. Okay. So at this point, we have some months where we're losing, some months that we're profitable. How do we lose some months? Well, it's getting better and better, and it gets to here, and then here we go back to a loss because we hired the second customer service person, right? If we didn't do that, it would just continue to improve. But, but if we didn't do that, we wouldn't maintain this, and then we'd start losing customers. So a company can't actually lose $161 if it doesn't have any money. So now we're going to go, I'm going to take some of these blank lines out here just to make room. So now what we're going to do is sort of a rolling um, cash flow. So how much cash we have in any, every, any given month is how much we had last month, plus or minus how much investment we gave up, plus or minus how much we made or lost. So our cash balance in the first month is going to be what we had the month before. Let me call this, yeah, let's do this one. Okay, so I'm going to have an investment line. And then we're going to have a a balance line, and so our balance in any given month equals our balance from the last month, which is zero in this case, plus our profit, plus our investment, and in this case. Do this running out, and you'll see we get more and more negative, more and more negative, until we finally start making up enough money to make up for all that loss. So what we can do is say, how much money do we need to invest to get rid of all that red? And the answer is, this is as negative as we go. So if we get an investment of two hundred twenty-two dollars and sixty-five cents. <coughs> was that's not enough to cover the big losses in the initial months. So we need a bigger investment than that. We need about 300. No, even more than that. Three, 350. Okay. Or what we could do is say we only got 200 here and then we need another 100 here and then we need another 50 here. So can do it in pieces or you can do it all at once. But this allows us to see how much investment we need to cover the losses we're going to incur in the beginning until we can get to what's called cash flow break even or, or, or being um, profitable. Now there's an assumption here. The assumption is you actually get the cash at the time the transaction occurred. So if somebody takes a loan out, when do you get paid? When it closes. Well, okay. So when it closes is when they take the loan out. That would be the that would be the date on which you can recognize the revenue and the date on which you get paid. So for example, when you get paid on a credit card, you're essentially getting paid typically two or three days after the transaction. On the other hand, if you're a B2B kind of business and you sell something to a customer and give them an invoice, you may not get paid for 30 days or 60 days or 90 days. That can have a, have a detrimental effect on the cash flow because you're paying for something now and you're not getting paid for it for, for months in the future. I'm not going to go into all of that now also. 
Um, but but it, perhaps a, uh, a way to make this cash flow even worse than that. So this is a very simple model of how to look at a company. And now we can go and play with any of the variables. What would happen if our average loan is not $1,000, but in fact it's $1,500? Well, we just made so much money, the numbers don't even fit themselves. In fact, what I'm just going to do is um, take out the decimal point. So now all of a sudden, We're going to have a balance of a million dollars. That doesn't quite look right. There's a mistake in here someplace. Slack to communicate, 
and you're probably using the free accounts, right? Okay. And that's exactly what I have here. There's a bunch of free clients. And it actually costs money. It's $104 to acquire each new company, which will bring with it four seats. Um, and we actually have data from Microsoft that tells us for, for products like Slack, the customer acquisition cost is $26. Microsoft has published that. And since we're acquiring four seats, 26 times four is 104. Our revenue from the free customers is zero. But we do have a hosting cost. And we also know that for something like Slack, it costs about 10 cents per seat to host it. So the free tier of customers is actually costing us some money. Um, unfortunately, it's so low it rounds off to zero here. In the outer months, it gets bigger. Um, then we have small business clients. And what we've assumed is that every month, 3% of our free clients are going to upgrade. And so that's what's going into these numbers. We also assume 20% was, so I'm going to put my mouse there. Ah, okay. So 3% of the free accounts upgrade. And then this particular piece of software, and this is actually an actual client I'm working with, they believe their software is very viral. And every enterprise customer will be inviting their vendors, their customers, their partners to participate with them. And they believe that every month for 20% uh, of their enterprise customers will cause somebody else to be a new customer. So, so I've got, I'm an enterprise account, you're one of my vendors, there's a 20% chance that you're going to love the software so much you're going to buy it for your own customer. So this says Every month, 20% of the number of clients we have here will become small business, new, new small business clients. And then the final number there is this number, which is the monthly churn rate. That's 2%. It means every month we're going to lose 2% of our customers in that tier. The churn rate up here is 0% because we actually know if somebody has a free account, they never actually shut it down. It just goes on and on forever. Whereas if you have a paying account, you don't want to use it anymore, you're actually going to shut it down so there's a churn rate. So, different assumptions for how we acquire small business clients from how we acquire free clients. And then, down here, we're actually going to have professional salespeople that are trying to do this. So here we're assuming each salesperson will be able to close two corporate clients and one enterprise client each month. Uh, we're also assuming here that the sales reps take three months to become effective. So really, every month, we're going to sell two corporate clients based on how many salespeople we had three months earlier. Because the new, the new salespeople aren't proficient yet. And then we have a 2% churn rate here, a 1% churn rate here, and the reason this is a 1% churn rate is anybody that's making an enterprise investment is going to do a lot more homework, a lot more investigation, and they're going to stick with it longer. So the churn, and this is well documented. I don't know if two and one are the right numbers, but it is well documented that the enterprise, is, they're, they're going to drop the product less frequently than, than smaller businesses. So you see how lots and lots of, of different kinds of assumptions can go into the different tiers. Then we add all that up and we get total number of clients versus total number of paid clients, total seats, total paid seats, total revenue, total cost of goods. Cost of goods is um, what, it, what our hosting costs are. So we subtract the COGS from that and we see what our revenue is and in, in terms of uh, our gross margin in terms of percent. And at 10 cents, oh, by the way, notice cost of goods was 10 cents here, 20 cents here, because there's an assumption that an enterprise client is going to want their data protected better. So you're actually going to have to have two or three copies of the data stored in different parts of the world. So if there's an earthquake or a fire at one data center, that enterprise client's information is secured properly. So 
So that's why we have a difference there. But the cost of goods re relative to the revenue is very, very low, which is why our gross margin is extremely high. And here it is in absolute dollars. And by the way, this is all done in thousands. So this is basically making $5,000 gross margin, 10, 15, growing like that. And we'll scroll down. Uh, here you can see their staffing plan, basically like we just modeled, but with the with the borders and everything, it's a little easier to read. There's actually, so actually, we get all the we get all the staffing expenses plus non-HR expenses. So total expenses, and if we scroll down a little longer, a little lower, we get to profit and loss, and everything is in thousands. So this this company actually right now thinks. They need about a $3 million investment. And the reason is because they're losing money. Now what I've done is created a chart that shows this. And this is sort of fun. So the red, isn't this fun? Print <laughs> sheets are thrilling. <laughs> Back when I was in high school, I took an English class on... on uh, Early American literature, I think. I don't remember. I didn't like it. But my English teacher said, we were reading Thoreau. And he said, how can, I, can you guys sit there looking just like this? This is so exciting. You should stand up on your desks and yell, yay, Thoreau. So guess who did that? He got sent to the principal's office. No way. <laughs> Yay, spreadsheets! Come on, I dare you. No, not on these chairs, they are wheels. <laughs> but you can stand up on the floor and do it. No takers. Oh, you're also boring. None of, none of you are going to be good entrepreneurs in life. Yeah. Okay, so... But, but the tone really wasn't there. Yay. Come on, Elisa. <laughs> okay. The red is our expenses. The green is revenue. And right here, we get to the point where revenue exceeds expenses. That's called cash flow break even. Very important point in the history of a company. The blue is our cash. Cash starts at zero until that $3 million investment comes in. And, and the blue line is on this axis, right? So, so there you see it's $3 million. And since we're losing money until this point, the blue is declining. Then we start making money. We get to the point where we're profitable, and the blue starts increasing. And this is a five-year plan. By the end of five years, this company will be sitting on $9 million cash in exchange for a $3 million investment, assuming, of course, reality and the model are somehow related. Yes? <coughs> And I'm, just to clarify, so let's say you're working B2, uh, B2B. Yes. And you're making a profit, however, with your clients you have a 90-day invoice policy. Yes. So technically, at that point, if you weren't receiving your invoices, they weren't being paid on time. That's right. The blue line could be on Absolutely. Right. And let's look at that. It's in the model. So we'll go back to data. And right here, I actually have an assumption that they're getting paid a month and a half, 45 days after invoice. And if we change that to three months and look at the chart, all of a sudden um, the cash gets a lot lower and they're only going to be on $7 million of cash at the end of five years instead of $9 million. So very important consideration, so, yeah. So they're trying to save 90 days. Uh, I used to work for a company that did that. It was really well, the good. option is, if, I don't know why they would do that. Usually it's 30 days. But if you do 90 days, you can sell the receivables for 80% of your money if you really need it. The banks will buy them from factors, factory can be a buyer, AR. So, same thing with your inventory. You can borrow 55% of your inventory. So, 
so or, or one of my companies um, actually started getting into a tight cash situation, and we just started offering our customers a one and a half percent discount if they paid within uh, 15 days. Right. And one and a half percent is cheaper than than the 10 or 12 percent or whatever you're going to pay for factoring. Usually it's 30 percent. 30, 30, 30, 30 days. Excuse me. Right. Well, so so our the company's standard terms were net 30, but in fact customers never pay on net 30. They pay on 45 to 60. But by offering a one and a half percent discount for paying within 15, we were able to collect within about 20. And of course, they still demanded the discount. That'd be option number one. But if they don't do that, then you can still sell it to a factoring right. company or a bank, get your money out of the deal to help with the cash. We don't want to do that forever, but. Yeah, get your money out. So, and, and actually, if we go back to the spreadsheet, I put in two assumptions there. Number one, how fast are you getting paid? And number two, how fast are you making payments? So I've assumed we're, we're good boys and girls, we're paying all of our bills on time, but in fact, if cash gets tight, we could put a delay in how, how long we're paying ours. So, so yeah, good, que good question, and yes, that is built into the model. Yeah. Okay, so it all makes sense. Students. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the bad ones left, huh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, sorry, I'm still here. But... <laughs> all right. That's all I got. I'll stick around for questions, or if we want to continue it, that's fine. So, team members. How much time? Are we done, sir? Uh, does anyone have questions? Yeah, yeah. You want to ask specific great questions about your, your, your you have questions? Later? Oh. Yeah, I just have an individual question. Okay. Okay. Anybody else? Anyone have questions that might be relevant to everyone? Yes. Sure. So everybody, can we thank Jeff for his time? Yeah. Thank you, Jeff.